So sentient beings may all be different, different shapes and sizes and colors and species and liking different foods and living in different places. But just like all of our friends here, Buddha Bear and company, uh, we can all get along even though that we're different. To get along, we don't have to say that we're all the same. We can respect each other. Although we have differences in our lives. But we can see that we're all the same in wanting happiness and not suffering. And in that way to support each other, help each other. And of course, the best way to help is to become a fully awakened Buddha with the compassion, wisdom, power, and the skill to really reach out and touch others' hearts in the way that they need it at that particular moment. So with that aspiration... We will listen to the teachings. Okay. Um, Our friends in Singapore who watch the teachings, it's Saturday morning when we have the teachings here on Friday night, they sent some questions last week, and they've really been thinking about things, yeah? So very good questions. So I'll go through those now, because I promised they would. So here's um, the read out the questions, and then the answers. So this is the Singapore group. We would like to know the difference and similarity between the 11 mental factors affecting the transcendental dependent origination in the Pali tradition and the 11 virtuous mental factors in the Tibetan psychology in Lohrig that we studied. We found some similarity between the two. Are they related in, in some way? Well, yes, there's a similarity between the lists and that each list has 11 factors in it, but uh, they don't overlap, and the the two uh, are designed for different purposes. When we talk about uh, the uh, 11 virtuous mental factors, it's showing us um, the mental states that we want to cultivate to... um, create virtuous karma and to practice the three higher trainings of ethical conduct, concentration, and wisdom. Um, so, but in the transcendental uh, dependent arising in the Pali tradition, uh, the, the 11 factors there, uh, some of them are the 11 virtuous ones, but some of them aren't, okay? Uh, because that list of the transcendental dependent arising is, is created to show how we can go from having dukkha, yeah, which is some mundane and unpleasant experience, how the dukkha can act as a cause for generating faith, and then faith and so on, one factor after the other leading to our hardship. So that list is for that person, purpose. Okay, now in terms of what they uh, overlap, both lists have faith, okay, or trust. Um, Both lists have pliancy, a flexibility of mind, and both lists have concentration, the ability to remain on an object for as uh, long as you want. So there's different, there are different lists, 
but these three mental factors are found on both of them. Okay, But there are other factors in each one that are not on the other. So, for example, joy is one of the dhyanic uh, factors that are present in the first and second dhyana. In other words, of the four dhyanas, the, the, the dhyanas are different uh, levels of concentration in the form realm. Then uh, joy is present in two of them. Yeah, But because uh, a joy feels very good, but joy can also be a little bit agitating. You know, it's like when you get too happy. Yeah. So uh, that's why in the third and fourth dhyana, and in the formless realms, there's the joy is not present. Okay? Bliss is a feeling. So it's not a virtuous, one of the 11 virtuous mental factors. And it's a um, one of the dhyanic factors in the first, second, and third dhyanas. Okay? But it uh, stops after the third dhyana and... Uh, because again, bliss is, is kind of too much, just if you want to stay concentrated. And instead, then there's equanimity, which is uh, a vir- one of the 11 virtuous mental factors that is able to um, balance the mind and abandon applying antidotes when they don't need to be applied and so on. Okay, so they have different purposes. So uh, then the Singapore group said, when one virtuous mental factor arises, the rest of the uh, virtuous mental factors also arise. So yes, I read that in in the teachings. I can't say I totally understand it because some of the virtuous mental factors uh, perform different functions and I'm not sure how they could always be present in the same mental states because they serve different functions. So that's a a question to put on the Geshe list. Geshe list's not here this evening, but you can uh, ask him. Okay, so, uh, yeah, Asanga says in the low rig text that every virtuous state of mind is accompanied by five omnipresent mental factors. Okay, you probably remember those. The five object ascertaining mental factors and ten of the virtuous mental factors. Yeah, it doesn't have uh, non-confusion because non-confusion is... uh, goes with the wisdom realizing emptiness. And you can have a virtuous mind without realizing emptiness. Okay, it's mundane virtue. Okay, so then um, the question is, will it be the same for the 11 transcendental dependent origination factors? In other words, when one is manifest, the others are manifest in the mind. And I would say no, because in that list, those 11 are described as cause and and effect. Okay, so we've been going through the cause and effect in in the teachings. So causes and their effects do not exist at the same time. They exist at different times. Okay, then they ask, uh, the purpose of knowing these factors is to help a practitioner know their state of mind as they practice concentration, especially the difference between delight and joy and joy and bliss and so on. Is that correct? So I think they're referring to the transcendental dependent arising, uh, those mental factors uh, that that are mentioned there, saying that they're... um, to help the practitioner know their state of mind as they practice concentration. Actually, it's not just so uh, they can know the mental factors that are present when they practice concentration, okay? Because, um, okay, so 
Yeah, so it's not just so they can identify those the mental factors in their mind when they develop serenity and the higher training and concentration. So the 11 transcendental dependent origination factors also have to do with the higher training and ethical conduct. And there is where the first two, faith and delight, fall. They help in... Um, in the yeah the uh, generating the higher training and ethical conduct so faith arises because um there is faith in the buddha and the buddha has described the system of karma and effect and because we trust the buddha then we trust the description of cause and effect um the description of cause and effect does make sense though you know, when you really study it well and what different causes are and what their results are, it, it does make sense. You can see why certain results are um, the results of particular actions or particular mental factors. Okay, so the first and second, faith and delight, pertain to the higher training in ethical conduct. And then uh, number th three... Four, five, and six, okay, which are okay, three is joy, then pliancy, bliss, and concentration. So those four mental factors are uh, for helping to generate the higher training and concentration. Okay, so joy because it's, it's present in the first and second um, dhyana. It makes the mind happy. Yeah, people are happy to have concentration. Pliancy makes the mind very flexible and makes the body flexible so that you can, uh, you know, stay in the meditation, same meditation position, stay focused on the same um, object. Yeah, and bliss also is a good incentive to do concentration if you feel blissful. And then concentration clearly is, is the um, mental factor that, that you're trying to really develop, not only in the four dhyanas, in the, in the form realm, but also the uh, four meditative uh, absorptions in the formless realm. They have uh, concentration too. Okay, so numbers three through six are for the higher training and concentration. Then, okay, um, cultivating insight uh, and uh, that insight being united with uh, serenity, yeah, that begins with number seven, knowledge and vision of, of things as they are. Okay, so when we understand uh, the nature, the arising, and the effect of phenomena, and we start understanding their, their uh, impermanence and nature of dukkha. Okay, so that's number seven. Okay, and it goes, the rest of them all go through, uh, apply to insight and to the higher training and wisdom. So disenchantment is the mental factor. Yeah, that's disenchanted, not enchanted anymore, bored, you know, tired of samsaric pleasure and uh, getting involved in all those things that we used to think were so fantastic. Um, then dispassion, which is the one that follows dis disenchantment. Um, Dispassion, uh, it applies to when you have, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the serenity and insight combined can penetrate and perceive nirvana, okay? So that's dispassion where you just are, um, yeah, you turn away from samsara. And that dispassion is the first of the trans, the, transcendental dependent origination factors that are actually um, transcendental, you know, 
Um, you have, to, in other words, you have to be an Arya. You can say super mundane instead of transcendental. So all 11 are called the transcendental dependent arising factors, but not all of them are actually transcendental. Some of them are worldly, they're mundane, yeah. But when we start with um, dispassion, yeah, and then liberation, and knowledge of the destruction of all pollutants, those three are uh, the results of the un- uh, unity of serenity and insight. Okay, so... There's a lot here. These are really good questions because they bring out the the points and how uh, this system, these 11 transcendental dependent arising factors, how they uh, apply to the three higher trainings. So you can see how somebody practicing the fundamental vehicle path can start you know, you start with dukkha, then you, your mind goes to faith, and then how you can develop the three higher trainings, which are all part of the fourth of the four truths, true path. Okay, so it shows how we develop the, the true path in the poly system. Okay, then... Um, if we compare the 11 stages of the transcendental dependent arising with the five bodhisattva paths, they are very different in the practice methods. Uh, no, are they very different in the practice methods for concentration? Or are they similar but different terms used for different traditions? So the mental factors that are applying to the development of concentration are the same in both the Pali system and the Sanskrit system. But like I said, not all 11 apply to the higher training of concentration. Okay. And, uh, you know, and they are different from the bodhisattva, the five bodhisattva paths. Um, yeah, they're, they're just different ways of explaining the path. Yeah. And just, uh, different ways of explaining how you go from an ordinary being to uh, to a transcendental being, yeah. Um, yeah, there's also five paths for the the people in the hearers and solitary realizers, yeah, in the Mahayana tradition, yeah, the five paths, there's five paths for for the shravakas, the hearers, five paths for the solitary realizers, five paths for the bodhisattvas. The paths have the same name, but they are a little bit different in terms of what happens, uh, what is abandoned on each path, because the people who practice these traditions have different motivations. Okay. Mm. Yeah, and also the uh, the Pali tradition, when they talk about the path for the fundamental vehicles, they talk about it principally in terms of what we call the four abiders and the uh, uh, no the four approachers and the four abiders, okay, or the four paths and the four fru- uh, fruits. So they explain, you know, when you first realize emptiness or, or nirvana, they say it as nirvana, uh, then you become an approacher to stream enter, and you're in the process of abandoning the first three fetters. When they've been abandoned, then you have the fruit of a stream enter. Uh, then uh, you become a, an approacher to the once returner, meaning somebody who only is born in the uh, desire realm one more time. And uh, when you have lessened sensual desire and uh, malice to a certain degree, then you become uh, an abider in, uh, how do you say it? Uh, An abider in one's returner, okay? And then, uh, then you practice some more, 
you become uh, you have become an approacher to a non-returner, and then the uh, you attain the uh, result of non-attainer, the the fruition, and that happens when uh, the uh, factors of sensual desire and and malice that you've subdued to become a once returner are now uh, purified from the mind completely. And then after that, you become an approacher to our hardship. And then uh, when you're eliminating the last uh, fetters, and then when you've completed li- eliminating them, you have the result of an arhat. Okay, so it's a different way in the fundamental vehicle of uh, laying out how one practices to go from an ordinary being to our hardship. And they, it, it involves all of these um, transcendental dependent arising factors. Okay, in the Sanskrit tradition, they'll explain the five paths and the five, um, yeah, the five paths for both, for all three vehicles. And they'll also talk about the, um, you know, the four uh, pairs, or what we call the eight approachers and abiders. That's also described in the tra- Sanskrit tradition. So this is technical information, but it's very helpful, you know, as you learn it. And it is described in more depth in volume six, Courageous Compassion. Okay. The second half of Courageous Compassion goes into uh, the paths and stages for all the different um, practitioners. Okay. So that's the questions from Singapore. Good questions, huh? They're thinking about what they're hearing. So that's quite good. Now, it's um, seven o'clock. I have to go because His Holiness is going to be online in a minute. Venerable Sumpton very kindly agreed to take over. So we will change. <laughs> So to quote Venable Children, we are so reactive. So I'm going to explain why I'm sitting here now, and it's going to tie into that quote. So yesterday was going pretty well. <laughs> you know how. <laughs> okay, you can tell the story then, Venable <laughs> Children. Oh, you can tell your version of it. It's probably better than mine. So it's going well, you know. Wonderful lunch. Fantastic teachings the whole week. And then after lunch, I take our Siamese cat out for a walk. So he's there waiting for me. So then uh, Venerable Children comes into my office and she's smiling. So that, of course, you know, I'm going to be talking about one of the links. Which link do you think I'm going to be talking about tonight? And it's just zero on and one of the 12 links. Feeling. So I see her f- smiling face, and that makes me very happy. And this pleasant feeling just comes, because when you see her smiling, that is a reaction that we have, I think. I guess if you have the karma to have that reaction, then <laughs> you would have that reaction. And then some words came out of her mouth. And she says, oh, by the way, so we were talking about something else that was equally pleasant. And then she said, by the way, um, would you do the last 30 minutes of the teaching tomorrow night? And I was like, (laughs) this is going through my mind. No, I can't. No, I can't. I can't. I'm not qualified. I can't. I didn't say anything. But in my mind, it's just... (laughs) I can't. I'm not qualified. I can't do it. I can't. I can't. And I started with, uh... (laughs) Because I was having aversion to the idea, I have to admit. It was an unpleasant feeling because this was only 26 hours ago. And I just don't have 
the kind of confidence to just come up here and do something. She, she said, well, do something about the 12 links. I said, uh, okay. Um, and so actually, as I was going, ah, uh, and I hadn't said yes yet, but I knew that there was only one right answer, right? I mean, we'd heard about her experience this past week with Lama Yeshe. It's very uh, selfish to not say yes to that kind of question, despite whatever, you know, limitations I have. So that was going, but in my head, also at 4,000 miles an hour, I was thinking, this is the perfect reason why I can't. You never, ever have the main feature first, and then you have the backup band second, <laughs> right? You don't do that. You don't have the Rolling Stones come on stage first with Buddha Bear and his clan, and then you have the Newport local high school band. You, know, you just don't do that. So everyone's already off. You know, everyone's clicked off and they've gone for a walk. So, here we are. <laughs> and that was going in my mind, and I said, uh, <sighs> so. I'm sure we've had experiences like that since two o'clock yesterday, where you encounter something and there's an immediate feeling that comes, and sometimes we're not even aware that it's happening. I will speak for myself. So I'll give you some more examples. So I've, you know, now in a state of shock yesterday, and we, I take the cat outside, and he's very happy. He's so happy to be outside. So I see him being blissed out, sniffing everything outside. And it's warm, and there's no big voices around scaring him, and there's no wind. And it's very, very beautiful, and I'm looking at him, and I have this pleasant feeling. And then out of the corner of my eye, I see a garter snake. Boom! And I've been working on my aversion for snakes for years here. Really, I take them, I nudge them off the road, but it was so interesting to notice that in a, I don't know how long it was, in less than a second, seeing that garter snake, and it was a small one, just this immediate aversion of, I'm afraid of that thing, it's small, and it's a snake. And I think, wow, that's really interesting that I have that reaction, I've been working on it so hard. So there was that. Um, and then um, a little bit later in the day, I went walking down the hill, and I was noticing that there's this green stuff growing on that place where we had the rime. So rime is a material that you put on a place to protect it from turkeys eating the grass seed and all of that and, you know, things like that. So we had this experiment earlier this year where we had gotten rid of this weed called bulbous bluegrass. By the way, Venerable said you only have to go for 30 minutes. So would someone be I'm keeping? I think I've been talking for 10. Um, so in 20 minutes is all over. I don't care where I'm at. It's over. And we'll dedicate. So I'm walking down the hill, and I see what we had uncovered the other day. And it was supposed to be grass growing, but it's this weirdest looking weed I've ever seen in my life. And it's scary looking, in fact. It really did well, but it's about this high. All of it is really green. So it's replaced the bulbous, the grass is hardly there at all, and there's this weird weed growing. And so I'm looking at that thinking, well, I have to admit I swore, but I'll have to purify that. Um, but, you know, immediately aversion seeing that place that was supposed to be beautiful grass, you know, so that it could sort of just take over and knock out the bulbous, and there's this weed. So it's just constant. You know, we see something with our senses. So I, you know, being a former teacher, I'm really not in favor of pop quizzes. So I'm going to go easy on you tonight. It's sort of like a review, but I'm going to make it really, really easy. So the one thing about this short talk, <laughs> very short, is that I saw that even in looking at the seventh link very briefly and looking over it, uh, I did get a pleasant feeling doing the review of this material. And I can see that... You know, even for those of us, maybe you're like me, you have a poor quality view going, um, thinking about this link of feeling and how we can actually stop it from moving on to what's the next link? Craving. We can actually do something about this. And that is a reason for celebration. So what's going to stop the first link? What's the first link in the 12 links? Ignorance. What's going to stop that? The, yes, realizing emptiness. That 
I'll just speak for myself. I don't know about you. That is a really long way off. And so when I look at the 12 links, it can be quite daunting in moments depressing and sad and discouraging, to say the least. But having this idea that we can start sawing away and chipping away at our reactions to things really is a place where an ordinary mind can make some headway. So I'll, I'll continue. So this morning, I'm in Ananda Hall. It's very early. It's very quiet. I'm bothering Venerable Semke, who's trying to sleep downstairs. And I'm looking for the container of the black tea, the bulk tea. It's usually there. It's really good tea. It's really full-bodied tea. I'm not hinting. Believe me, I'm not hinting. It's really good tea. The whole container wasn't there. So I open the drawer and it's like, ah. Oh. Unpleasant feeling. And then I'm starting to think, okay, who took it away? <laughs> and I'll have words with that person a little bit later after the talk. But it's going to be such a short talk that... <laughs> so anyway... I think you can, you have compassion for yourself and for other people who are, we're constantly seeing things with our senses. So what are the six avenues that we're bombarded with all day long? We, con we contact things and what are the six consciousnesses that bring in all this information? Visual, auditory, olfactory, gustatory. Tactile, the mental. We're bombarded. I mean, you can think about the fact that everyone wants happiness and doesn't want suffering, but when you really think about the fact that we're all bombarded moment by moment, doesn't that also make compassion arise in your heart? You know, we see it in others, we see it in ourselves all day long. All day long. We see something pleasant, we something, see something else unpleasant. So I thought I'd do um, just a quick review of what comes before feeling, which is contact. Okay. So contact is the moment when a faculty, an object of cognition, and a moment of consciousness meet. In dependence on this moment of contact, the object is distinguished as either attractive, pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. So there's the six kinds. Feeling is the experience of the ripening of our karmic seeds. Isn't that shocking? So Venerable gave us some homework a few weeks ago. You know, she told us to go through each of the 12 links really slowly. So in the next 14 minutes, which is all we have left, we're going to really look at feeling. So we have one feeling after another. And this is the way we experience our life. That's sobering, isn't it? It's the way we experience our life. And most of the effort of our life is directed at getting a pleasant feeling, hanging on to it, and avoiding the unpleasant. Just check it out, you know, check it out. And each experience of feeling is the ripened fruit of karmic seeds that we planted in the past. That sentence just really gets my attention. It's just so, you know, there's nothing difficult about this, but it's so impactful. Each experience of feeling is the ripened fruit of karmic seeds that we planted in the past. The results of causes we created by our previous actions. So I don't know, maybe you walk down the hill and you see that green weird plant growing on the hillside and you think, beautiful. <laughs> it's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Maybe we can boil it. <laughs> maybe we can drink it and it's going to be really... What does that other plant do? What does it do, Venable Pendi? That stuff you pick? Nettles. nettles. Maybe it's a competition for nettles. Maybe it's going to extend our lifespan. And you'll look at it, and every time you go down the hill, you think, wow, I'm so happy they did that work. It looks so good. And you'll have that reaction because you created the causes for it in the past.
and I have not. So what follows this, of course, what's the link that follows feeling? Craving. So that craving is attachment. It's not the kind of attachment we heard, out, I heard about earlier today that's in the positive realm. This is, this is an afflicted mental state. So when an enjoyable feeling arises, we become attached to it. We don't want to separate from it. On the contrary, we want more and better. And even when the pain and discomfort arise, there's craving, right? We've got pain in our hip, pain in our sciatica. We've got pain from lifting all those dishes in the kitchen. And there's this craving to be free from that pain, the unpleasant feeling. Okay, I either have to start talking very quickly, or we're going to go over time. (laughs) No! Okay, it's a dilemma. So I found a teaching that Venerable Children gave in 2006. So the Abbey was how many years old? Three years old. And her voice was just so sweet, and she was just so excited giving this teaching. And so I thought I would do what she did earlier this week. I'd read you part of this teaching, just like she did with reading uh, Lama Yeshe's teaching. And it's great. It's really great. So in talking about the 12 links, particularly the link of feeling, she starts with, when we contact different objects, we get feelings. Painful, pleasurable, neutral. We are bound tightly to our feelings of pleasure. We're bound by it. The pleasure that we have to have, we want it. We'll do almost anything to experience pleasure and to avoid pain. And so she said, this is really important to remember that we will do almost anything. Think about your teen years. Come on. Think about your early 20s, mid 20s, maybe your 30s. Maybe your 40s. <laughs> Maybe your 60s. I don't know. But we'll do almost anything to experience pleasure. Some of the stories we have, we're embarrassed to tell others. But we'll tell them later after this teaching. <laughs> Kidding. So we grab at it. I want this. I want to have that. I want more of it. We don't fall asleep in our pursuit of this, do we? We don't get distracted. We don't get bored. We're just on it. And with the uncomfortable feeling, then we notice that we can't endure the smallest, tiniest, little bit of displeasure. We got to get away from it. We don't want it. We don't want this bug in my house. I don't like this color. I don't like this food. How do you, what do you mean, talking to me in that tone of voice? The slightest bit of the feeling of displeasure, and we don't want it at all. So we're reactive. We're reacting all day long. And this is the part that really got my attention in this talk that she gave. It's almost as if we don't have any choice. And this is why people, us, before meeting the Dharma, maybe still, This is why we seem to live on automatic. It seems like we don't have choice. And what is it that makes us live on automatic, Venerable says? It's the incredible attachment to pleasure and the incredible aversion to discomfort. So much so that it's almost as if we don't have a choice because we're so hooked into those two. That describes my life before I met the Dharma. I'm honest. I was so hooked. The pursuit was ruthless. And I made some very big mistakes. Fortunately, I met Enrol Chodron and the Dharma, and I'm still purifying some of those things. So, she says, watch your life. Watch in every moment. When we have a pleasant feeling, we think it was produced by something external, like the object or a place or a person, right? Walking on the Oregon coast. 
with your best friend. And there's a slight breeze. And the view of the coastline goes for miles. And that is pleasure. Or we look at this flower, we think, well, if you have the karma, you may think, you know, it's a really beautiful flower. And that's giving me a lot of pleasure when I look at that flower, because the color is so rich, right? Very rich. And then I get attached to the flower. And I want the feeling of pleasure, but I don't recognize that it's the internal feeling of pleasure that I'm hooked on, I get mistaken and I think that pleasure, that feeling of pleasure, is coming from this flower. So I get stuck in the flower. And nobody else can have it. You can't. It's my flower. And I want that flower to last forever because when I look at this, wow, it's just guaranteed, like, guaranteed pleasure. That color, guaranteed. Every time I look at it, it's pleasure. Look, see? It's mine. And then when it starts to fade, then I start to cry. And then Venable goes on to say, you know, this is like falling in love. You know, we fall in love with this wonderful person. And then, if you're old enough, and you have this memory of it, and then they get old, like the flower. And this wonderful person gets old. They're so good looking. I mean, have you see, have you read obituaries lately of people who were maybe someone you really paid attention to when you were younger? And of course, those of us in the room who are older, we have a longer way to look back. And then we f- look at the picture of the person who just passed away and think, what? That's James Caan? What? I mean, every time that happens to me, I think, what? That's not him. Couldn't be. So Venomo goes on to say, you know, then we're heartbroken. You know, this person went and got old on me. Not looking in the mirror at ourselves. And then the person dies, right? And we're heartbroken. Heartbroken. Because they're supposed to last forever. Because my happiness was in that person. I thought... And so Venomal says, we're living in this hallucination. We expect the flower never to get old. And we expect the good-looking one never to get old. But they do. It's such a drag. And we confuse the pleasant feeling with the object that we think caused that feeling. And we latch on to the object. And this thing is changing moment by moment. I don't have that kind of wisdom yet, but it's changing moment by moment. I mean, earlier today, it looked like this. I mean, (laughs) one like this now looks like this. So then we have to look at what we do to get this thing that we're clinging to. So she's, she's continuing a flower, you know, and she says, this is a, kind of a ridiculous example, but she says, what is your flower? What is it for you that you will chase after and do anything for? Because we think that the happiness is in the object. So we go through this over and over again. And to get the flower, you know, pretty soon this one's going to be dead. They're all going to be dead out there. I'm going to get more. And then I have to get a job because the flowers cost money. And then to get a job, I have to have the right kind of clothes, have to have the right kind of car, have to hang out with the right kind of people, gardening kind of folks that know something about flowers. And then it just continues. I have to get the job, to get the clothes, get the car to get the money, to have the job, to buy the flowers, and over and over and over and over and over again. So our whole life is taken up with everything that we have to do to get our flower, to protect our flower. And then some comes along and they say, you know, that flower looks kind of old. I'm going to throw it away. 
And I get really riled and I say, don't touch that flower. It's my flower. Don't touch it. Because I'm clinging to that flower because it's so gorgeous and it gives me, every time I look at it, pleasure. It's guaranteed. So it looks like this. So then I say, you know, don't touch my flower. And then we have some harsh words. And then I give some threatening words back. You know, if you take my flower, I'm going to talk about you behind your back. I'm going to tell people stuff about you. I'm going to make it up. Actually, I might just tell you to your face. Don't touch my flower. It's not getting old. This brings me happiness. Don't go near it. And if you go near it, I've got important friends. They're going to deal with you. I can promise you. Now, it's ridiculous, right? But this happens. This happens. And don't tell me my flower is ugly. That's the end of the relationship right there. You tell me my flower is ugly, we're done. Sorry. Over. So Venerable says, you know, really look carefully. This is a ridiculous example, but look at what your flower is. What do you still chase? What do you still do almost anything for to get it? And what kind of karma do we create as we're chasing it? So to finish off, I think I'm over time now. Mm. (laughs) Um, We'll finish off with some wisdom from Volume 3, His Holiness and Venerable Children. And this is, the very, this is where we get to the good news part. It's not hopeless. There's something we can do. And so His Holiness says, if we observe our experience closely, we will notice how many feelings we experience one after the other during the day. We'll see that we are so reactive to those feelings. Our craving to have pleasure and to avoid pain is strong. It affects our moods and motivates most of our actions. The idea of experiencing pleasure from our morning cup of coffee or tea gets us out of bed in the morning, seeking the happiness that comes from having money and possessions we go to work, craving to be free of pain. We defend ourselves against criticism and lash out at anything that hurts us or inconveniences us. We lash out. Okay, here's the good news. The space between feeling and craving is the one place, one of the places, where the forward motion of dependent origination can be broken. So feelings naturally arise when contact with external objects or internal objects such as memories, ideas, and plans occur. But by being aware of feelings and noting them with introspective awareness, It's possible to prevent craving from arising in response to them. We practice observing feelings without reacting to them, observing where they come from, where they abide, and where they go. So, you know, there's, it would be impossible to work on all six of the kinds of consciousnesses that we have, that we're taking in information from. You know, I think the best way to go about this, and this is my plan, is to take one at a time. So you may look at the fi- at the six, you know, visual, auditory, olfactory, gustatory, mental, tactile. There may be one there that is strongest for you. There may be two or three that are strongest. But maybe, you know, for an entire week, we picked one. So I tried it this morning and I failed. I'll tell you. I saw the nectarines in the bowl. I saw the beautiful fruit bowl with the melon and the raspberries, and I just went for it. I didn't think for a minute. There's 29 other people behind me. The bowl was pretty big. You know, I thought, yeah, I think there's enough. But I went for it. So what I can do next time is when I see the nectarines or the peaches or the pears, you know, I can just think to myself, you know, how much of that fruit really makes me happy? Venema Rinchen mentioned this in her BBC the other day. You know, could I just be as happy with one piece of nectarine? 
I think so. <laughs> One piece. You know, you get that flavor. You get the nectarine flavor. Is it going to bring me closer to realizing impermanence, having six pieces of nectarine? No. Is it going to get me closer to anything in the Dharma world? No. So I would say, you know, pick one of the consciousnesses, do it for a week, just notice how you can start reducing. You know, and so I failed this morning. I'm not going to be my, beat myself up about it. I've just decided that. I'm not. I failed. So I'll try again tomorrow. And Venerable Damcho is going to be right behind me because we go in order and she can, <laughs> you know, really watch what I do. Now everyone will be watching what I do. <laughs> okay. She's going to take the other six pieces. Way to go. So slowly, 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 we can start chipping away at what happens at lightning speed. And I'm just going to finish with this. I love making little videos. I haven't done it in a while, but one of the reasons I love making little videos is that you get to see life in slow motion. It's beautiful. It doesn't matter who it is in the frame. You get to see the person moving through space and you get to change, you know, different things about the clip and you really look at that person and you can appreciate who they are and it's in slow motion and you can just see you know, that the way we operate the most of the time, the way I operate most of the time, is far too fast. And I'm losing contact with people. I'm losing the opportunity to notice these feelings that are arising nonstop. I'm losing the opportunity to do what His Holiness and Venable says we can do. We can stop it. We can stop the feeling from going to craving. Now, it's going to take a long time for some of these consciousnesses you know, since beginningless time, come on. But we can start making a reduction in it. And that's, I'm convinced, what an ordinary mind like mine can do. And then there's a reason for rejoicing. So slowly, slowly, we can chip away at this. We can slow down the reactions. And instead of reacting, we can act with a kind heart. We can act in the way that we want to be with others and to really be present with them. So I'm way over time. Thanks for putting up with the way over time. And um, thanks, Venerable Children, for this opportunity. And we're going to dedicate.